One of the things that we have learned at the conference that we can use when we go back to Haiti is uh, we have found a very good source of seed that we can use for uh, our agricultural program. And, um, and also uh, what is very important is how to, how to store seed and keep the seeds. My name is uh, Virginal Laguerre. I say thank you so much uh, at ECHO for the conference. My name is Victoria. I'm coming from Nigeria. So I attend this ECHO conference. It has been wonderful. All I can say is that if you want to do your ministry, your work, your project in a better way, this is a place to get tools to do it that. It has been uh, just great in order to network with so many people that, uh, that have experience in this area, that we are looking for information and, and we can share information as well. So it has been just a great experience for us. Yeah, remember folks, keep thinking about some of those things you're learning and be writing them down, taking them down. We'd of course love to hear about them, but what's most important is that you're writing down in your notebooks and uh, putting it back in the back of your head, what you're gonna take home with you um, from this conference. So our next speaker this morning is Alexandra Spildock, the Executive Director of Compatible Technology International, maybe better known as CTI. That's what I always remember hearing at my time in Haiti. Um, CTI specializes in post-harvest technology solutions for smallholders in sub-Saharan Africa. Alexandra has her master's degree in international policy and has worked over 20 years in international policy and development as an expert in agricultural trade and agribusiness development. Um, prior to CTI, Alexandra has was the coordinator for the global network of women ministers and leaders in agriculture and the International Gender Trade Network. Um, before I ask her to come up here, I just want to share one more story. Um, over the years, uh, I've seen some of these tools that we're going to hear about in situations like Haiti. And I pers have a personal story, and I heard one last night that was moving from a Peace Corps volunteer. But my father used to buy, get all, his hands on some of your all's tools, especially um, the peanut grinder, and was able to help women access those grinders. And being able to see the impact of these women in Haiti who are often were the single mothers who didn't really have a way to provide for their family, and able to take that tool and provide for their family by milling peanut butter um, in their community. And I just personally got to see how that impacted many women's lives. And I just want to thank you for that and what you all are doing. Now, please join me in welcoming Alexandra. Good morning. Um, well, I don't need to tell you my name. Um, I'm Alexandra. I'll tell you again anyway. Um, I want to thank the ECHO staff first and foremost. You've been so helpful to me, um, Nate and Renee and Danielle and Brian and Dave. Um, all, the, all the staff here have been uh, wonderful in the time that I've been here and in even just the presentation up and going today. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to jump into the slides in a second, but I, I do want to um, say that I really appreciated um, listening to the various presentations yesterday and today, and um, there were some things that really jumped out for me in terms of the value of the work as I see it. And um, one came from one of the first presentations yesterday from Pete Knoll about, around the importance of food systems and holistic approaches to understanding food systems. Both, both at the micro level, but also understanding the macro challenges that so many smallholder farmers are facing in terms of being able to invest in more diverse agricultural production and more diverse diets. Um, the second thing is that um, I heard specialists from um, various different um, walks of life, myself included, and um, I appreciate so much the expertise and the knowledge in this room. And I hope that we will, um, if I don't take up all the time, have a little bit of extra time for Q&A. 
If not, we'll have some time in the afternoon. But again, we come at this work from multiple angles, and it's so important in terms of understanding where the true challenges lie. Um, the third is that um, I really have um, seen and heard a lot of optimism. So there are real challenges, but there are so many good things that are happening. The work that all of you are doing, the work that I'm seeing daily through CTI and through partners, um, lifts me up. It gives me energy and hope and um, pushes me to do better. And I think that's why we're all here. And so um, that's my morning pep talk to you <laughs> and to myself. Let me get started. So um, compatible technology um, is a uh, global nonprofit. We're actually based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Anybody been to Minnesota in the room? Nice. <laughs> so uh, we're a farming state. A lot of the global food companies are actually based in Minnesota. So you'll see that General Mills, Cargill are based in Minnesota. Um, our primary crops are soy and corn, but we do also have um, smaller farms that are doing all kinds of um, crops supporting local food markets. Um, we're a very cold state just below Canada. For those of you who haven't been there, um, this is a good time to be in Florida. <laughs> and. Um, we're, we're quite interesting, actually. We were started in 1981 uh, by a food scientist who came out of General Mills. And um, upon retiring, he had a, a vision to develop technologies for the rural poor. And the first project, actually, that we worked on came, um, was in India, in Uttar Pradesh. And it, um, it came out of a mission trip that was organized there. And the project was really focused on multiple aspects uh, having to do with post-harvest preservation, processing, and then small enterprise development. It was particularly focused on potatoes, peeling, um, you know, shredding, drying, storing, packaging, labeling, and I think it's a good example in terms of all the um, potential that is still there to save quality food um, crops like the ones that were just mentioned in the last um, presentation are so important and so much of the time where they are being grown they they rot um, they have a short shelf life and um, we haven't managed yet to figure out ways to preserve this wonderful food in some of the uh, the poorer areas of the world so we started in India we also then um, got into maize drying or corn drying and storage in Guatemala. Um, Brian mentioned that we have a, a grinder that works for peanut butter. It works for a whole range of crops, including breadfruit, rice, cocoa, coffee, et cetera, et cetera, um, millet, sorghum, all kinds of, of crops. And that's actually in 49 different countries. And um, so that's an, been an important technology for us as we have evolved over the years. But the premise of our organization is really to figure out how we, can, um, how we can do our part to really strengthen um, agricultural markets at the base that have largely been forgotten, and how we can bring in a holistic approach to that work, and also how we can bring in expertise from the United States um, and do our part um, while also investing in knowledge and expertise and creativity coming from um, developing countries. And that's a mix of looking at what tools um, are available that can be adapted and promoted. Uh, as you, all of you will see in a second, the kinds of tools that we work on, either manually operated or simple motorized, solar powered, these are, these are tools that existed centuries ago here in the United States. And it's with these tools that the United States was actually able to evolve to a sort of another, another level of agricultural production and um, I think it was a real game changer here. And, um, and so we're not talking about rockets, um, but, but genuinely simple, um, appropriate technologies for those in need. The second component of the work that CTI does is around um, looking at various aspects of technical training and providing that support to uh, groups of farmers um, so that they have, their, they have capacity and self-sufficiency um, within their communities. And when I say product development here, that means different things to different people, but, um, and it sounds very technical, but I'm really talking about food. 
and various ways to package food and um, support nutritious food development in, in, um, in other areas. So here's an example of some of the, um, the experts that we work with, volunteers, um, like Don Jacobson, who's a good friend of mine. He comes in every day still to CTI. He's a biochemist from, from General Mills and um, has a passion for, for this work. Um, Dr. Vern Cardwell, who's an agronomist. So I mentioned I'm not an agronomist, but, um, but we do definitely have a, a mix of experts in our, in, our, um, in our world who are providing their support in terms of understanding the crops we're working with. And then, of course, um, uh, Miranda uh, Grizio, who's a food scientist who's based out of um, Boston, actually. I think one of the challenges that we found um, historically when looking at appropriate technology, which many of you I'm sure have seen in the field, um, small machines that are rusting, maybe not being used because a part broke or maybe the farmers didn't have enough money to pay for gas for the motor or what have you, um, you know, has to do with first getting closer to understanding the need. So there's a technological need, but there's also um, a kind of a bigger need and grounding ourselves in that is quite important. And that has to do with really looking at what are some of the reasons for international uh, global hunger? Where are some of those trends? How does that affect our food supply? What is the relationship with climate change, conflict, migration? All of these things are really important. And they're affecting so many communities and um, their ability to, you know, to stay resilient and, and um, to nourish themselves. What we've seen is that um, hunger is actually on the rise. The United Nations just came out with a report this year that, um, uh, rep that basically says that the number of those who are hungry has gone up to actually 821 million. I rounded down, but it's actually up. And then if you really start to um, capture all the components around um, hidden hunger, we see that then it's closer to 2 billion people who are malnourished. And from a structural point of view, from a food security point of view, you start to get into questions around access, affordability of food, availability of food, stability of food, all of these things impacting um, these numbers today. What the report also says is that um, climate change is one of the biggest factors that's really having this negative impact on, on hunger, as well as, of course, um, some of the violence in certain regions where pockets are particularly struggling. The other thing we know is that um, at least, at least a third of the food that's produced is lost or wasted. And I say lost or wasted. So we have this conversation going on in the United States about food waste and saving food, but particularly around food waste, where in Las Vegas or whatever, mounds and mounds of food are, are being thrown out, or at the football stadium at the, at the Super Bowl, um, you know, the amount of food that's wasted in just one day. But it's the opposite in so many countries um, in the developing world, and I know that all of you experience this as well, uh, where um, very healthy uh, food that's being produced has nowhere to go. We increase our production levels, we put more inputs, we improve our agroecological practices, we see these incredible yields and then farmers don't know how to or don't have the tools and the means to be able to, um, to process them um, more efficiently and to save the food. And it's a big challenge, um, and I'll say some more about that. Now, CTI, as Brian um, rightfully mentioned, we've been in Haiti. Uh, we were working with Breadfruit in Haiti, actually, in small enterprise development there um, with different groups, including one of the Methodist churches there. Um, we made a decision a few years back to focus on Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, recognizing that there's a need in many parts of the world, but also recognizing where there's the biggest challenge. Because when you look at statistics on hunger, on poverty, on uh, unemployment, and youth unemployment in particular, all expected to rise exponentially by 2050, um, you see that um, there's a real opportunity with Sub-Saharan Africa, where currently today, a fourth of the continent of sub-Saharan African countries are food insecure. One fourth. Imagine how that grows when we don't invest in some basic solutions for the, um, you know, for for some of the countries in need. And that has a lot to do with infrastructure, and um, you know, renewed attention to agriculture, which represents the largest percentage of GDP 
in many of these countries. Um, and while there's a lot of attention on the growing urban areas, we come back to who's going to grow our food and how do we make sure that communities can um, stay vitalized and, um, and be able to nourish um, their populations. So we focus on Africa because it's the right thing to do, because it promotes sustainability more broadly. Um, I think there's a peace and security argument that I regularly make to, the, to our congressional representatives in Minnesota. Um, and to our government in terms of what international development also does to promote peace and security and overall well-being. Now, the premise is Africa can feed herself, and um, that has to do with self-sufficiency for um, uh, many countries that have been um, net food importing countries um, herself, because uh, we'll talk more about it, but I think it's really important that we remember who's producing our food and at what point in the production um, women and men are, are, are located, um, because I think that women are doing much of the post-harvest work, about 90% of the post-harvest processing and food preparation is done by women. So it's not gender neutral, it's not even close to gender neutral, and by investing in that other half, um, I think we can do a lot in terms of strengthening growth, improving equity within households and communities, and general well-being, and hopefully shared activity between women and men, and um, you know, new opportunity for farm families. The other thing is that um, I come from a position that uh, we do need to focus on post-harvest business solutions um, that include the tools, yes, but the tools are just one part of the equation. So it's about building capacity and um, investing in, um, in new jobs um, to, to, um, so that, again, Africa has the capacity to feed herself. So I just want to say, um, you know, productivity is a major challenge due to lack of mechanization. It still blows my mind, and I'm sure it blows yours as well, that to see that um, farmers are still harvesting their crops in so many places with a hand hoe. And uh, yet there's some expectation that economic growth, we, we need to invest in economic growth and new efficiency, et cetera. How do you do that when you spend so much of your time in the hot sun with a hand hoe? And here's an example of a gentleman um, harvesting peanuts in Malawi, um, of course, by hand in the hot sun. Here's another example, um, and I'll, you'll see many more like this, of women with a mortar and pestle, in this case in Senegal. Um, and they're, they're processing pearl millet. They spend a great portion of their day to um, strip the millet, to thresh the millet, to winnow the millet, to, you know, to, gr to, to grind the millet, prepare one meal. And then here's an example of traditional ways of making peanut butter with two rocks pushing, you know, rubbing them together. So there's a lot of work that goes into this, and it's important for us to understand this in terms of what, where the work really lies and how we can make a real difference. Now I want to say a few more words about pearl millet. Um, does everybody, has everybody um, worked with pearl millet or seen pearl millet in their travels? Okay. Well, this is another highly nutritious tr crop. And it's a crop that, like sorghum, and I think Tim was mentioning this yesterday, um, is grown throughout the Western Sahel region. So you'll find it in Niger, in Burkina Faso, in Ghana, in Senegal, um, Nigeria. So many of the African countries um, in that part of the world are um, growing millet. It's also grown um, and consumed. There are multiple varieties of pearl millet that are also grown in India and, and other places. And essentially, it feeds hundreds of millions of people. It's highly nutritious, it's drought resistant, it's part of cultural and religious traditions, and um, there has been an effort within Senegal, but also within West African countries to promote self-sufficiency, um, to reduce sort of the volatility within the global food market and countries' ability to feed themselves with crops like pearl millet. One of the major challenges is that millet is a food security crop. It's a smallholder crop, and there's been very little investment that's gone into uh, pearl millet as opposed to some other crops like rice or like maize. But there is um, a lot of evidence now showing that um, crops like millet and sorghum, which have grown in Africa for centuries, um, have the resilience to be able to also um, be a real opportunity for future markets and nutrition and food security. One of the major challenges with millet, as you're going to see as my recurring theme, is just how much millet is actually lost when you look at the traditional processing method and the time and labor that goes into, um, into that. 
And here's an example of, I'm not sure if the video will work, no. So how it was done in 1890, and then how it's done today. Usually I have a little video that shows the women pounding the millet and what that looks like. It's actually a skill, I've tried it, I was told I was terrible. Um, and uh, the mortar, and I mean it's very heavy, um, but um, women have certainly been doing it for a long time and, and have become quite good at it. Um, nonetheless, it's highly inefficient. So CTI worked on a, um, uh, a threshing, uh, a, a multi sort of processing unit. Um, we went in to understand the need with the communities. We have continued to um, design our technology and this one in particular for cereals with smallholder farmers, getting their feedback along the way so that we can see a real um, improvement in terms of the time that they um, spend, less of it, but also whole clean grain because by processing with a mortar and pestle, you also crack the grain, which um, can lead to rancidity and loss. And so with whole clean grain that doesn't touch the ground, we also see that the grain can contribute to, um, there's more nutrition at the household level. And um, what we've been looking at is where there's a potential market for the machine and also for crops that are made with millet. How to supply local food markets in particular and how to also create a model, a return on investment, so to speak, for smallholders where they um, either are using machines for fee for service to make it easier on others or, um, or providing food products. But there are major challenges. So again, as I mentioned, we have a tool, so what? So one of the, I'm just going to quickly go through this. I don't have all the time in the world to do this, but I want to just point out that one of the major challenges we see is that there is technology out there. It's large-scale technology. It's in the tens of thousands often. It doesn't respond to the actual needs within the communities, or even a million-dollar machine I've seen as well. Um, how, do you, how do you manufacture, how do you design in, in, from an engineering perspective, and how do you manufacture in-country? A lot of times the parts aren't available within, within Africa, how to, um, how to get those in and how to, at the very least, support final assembly and local distribution, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the work that we've been pulled into. And if you look at the picture uh, with, the, with the blue machine on the left and the, and the flywheel, you'll see our, uh, that's one of the manufacturing shops that we're working with in West Africa um, to produce a whole range of machines for us. Now, on the delivery, I just have to say, <laughs> I love this picture, we call it the delivery, because to get that, uh, that thresher, you can see um, on the horse cart, we started in a truck, we hit a tree, a chain fell off the machine, we had to find a bike shop nearby to replace the chain, then we had to put it in a canoe, and, we put the <laughs> and then we canoed all the way across to this island called Marloge, where in fact we then put the machine on a horse cart and we clippity-clopped to the village, which had never seen technology before. And so, when we, so there's no profit in this model. I always say the private sector isn't there because it's not profitable, but it's the right thing to do. And um, how can we do our part to also um, strengthen capacity again for them to be able to process more efficiently, learn new skills, and um, increase food supply. Now, if you look at the bottom um, picture, I'll just, there's a woman being interviewed there. That's about how can we do a better job of promoting within communities, and again, you know, um, in the languages where people speak, using traditional languages, a lot of pictures, radio, and various ways of putting the farmer first, getting her testimony, so that she's at the center of the story, not the CTI, and that's really quite critical. And then lastly, if you look at this photo on the bottom of the woman in the red dress, there'll be a picture of her again, but you can see she's selling, in this case, peanut butter. She's selling it in a big plastic pot or bucket, um, it's not particularly clean. And so if we're really serious about what we're doing, we need to look at food safety, food quality, and some professionalism, professionalization of, um, of local product development without overcomplicating everything. I mean, we can do a lot where, where people are in a, in, a, in a relatively simple way and make a big difference. And we were listening to examples from colleagues yesterday about work that they're doing also in Mozambique, and I think there are many good examples that are out there, so we're all in this together. Here's an example of how to do African assembly. We've been working with our manufacturer just to do that, and simple challenges around where do you store machines. So many of the local machine shops actually don't have much space, and, um, and, but yet if you leave these machines out in the hot sun or in rainy season, of course they're gonna rust, they're gonna be useless, so we're trying to work through that um, organization as well. 
And here's an example of some promotion that we did. Plus de cereal en moins de temps means more cereal in less time. And we tried to show lots of pictures on that. Now back to the farmer return on investment. Um, again, how do we increase revenue? How do we think about um, local products being sold in markets? You know, there are different ways to come at this work, but I am con consistently seeing that farmers do, um, that, that at the subsistence level, that having more money also is important in terms of them being able to um, really uh, you know, effectively s contribute and sustain um, the machines and their own enterprise development. And that's something that I think we can discuss further in terms of how far would you go with a market model um, with some of this work. But I do believe that um, the local product development is a huge opportunity where um, I think it was mentioned yesterday, we're seeing um, food deserts or local, local markets that have basically Coca-Cola and chips and where are all the diverse healthy products. By the way, I was commenting to somebody last night that um, if you look at the little kiosk next to the reception area, it's chips and it's um, Coca-Cola and candy bars. So, um, you know, lots of always comparisons to be, to be drawn. <laughs> but again, another example where just with some simple packaging, we start to see that there is some, there's some new opportunity. And this again with peanut butter, but here is with maize flour, with millet flour, um, and, um, and looking also at nutritious baby food products. We're mixing baobab and, um, and millet, sorghum, and groundnuts um, as part of a porridge that can, that can also help them to stabilize in their first days of life. Here's an example with a grinder. And uh, the gentleman in the blue um, uh, costume there is a uh, He's a uh, president of a farmers association of 10,000 farmers. And they're all um, working to develop products and also to sell to local bakeries as part of an initiative to, um, to strengthen food supply and also to see some, um, some revenue coming to communities from that. And then here's an example of an actual national buyer. This guy has a factory um, based in Dakar in Senegal. His name is Pierre Njai. And he's, um, he's actually a dairy farmer himself, um, who a businessman, made it big. Um, now he, he jokes he only eats millet, and I think he really means it. Um, he's decided that he doesn't want all the imported rice coming into Senegal. He's going to focus on millet and building an industry there. But he basically makes snack products throughout the country at higher, more obviously, um, more organized markets. You can see yogurt drinks and chakri, which is a millet and yogurt snack and other things. But he's an example of somebody, if they could get more supply, more quality supply in a timely fashion from small farmers, is willing to buy. Having been a small farmer himself, he wants to give back. And so that's the other sort of piece of work. How do we help farmers become more efficient and also to produce, um, produce more to get it where it needs to go? Now, here's another example of another crop. I spent a lot of time on pearl millet. Let me also say a few words about ground nuts or peanuts which are highly valuable. They're nutritious, obviously, with high levels of protein and oil. Um, but they also um, help to fix nitrogen in the soil. And they're also used um, in sustainable agricultural practices for intercropping with maize. We were invited by a research institution called ICRASAT, um, to, which is doing a lot of work on, on plant breeding and seed breeding with various types of legumes to look at the, the pro post-harvest processing and the labor constraints that farmers are facing from harvesting with a hand hoe, from uh, stripping and shelling nuts. One of the major challenges that farmers are experiencing is with, uh, particularly in Southern Africa, is that they wet the nuts to make it easier to actually get the nuts out of the shell. Because imagine if you're shelling nuts after a while, they start to get cut from the shells and um, your hands go raw. So it makes sense that you would wet the nuts. But by doing that, that also increases um, mold and um, mycotoxins like aflatoxin that ultimately damage the nut. It's not the sole point of damage or, or um, uh, yeah, of damage, but it is, um, it's a major area where um, very little has been done to date. And there's a real opportunity through simple technology and dry shelling to actually greatly improve the health of millions of people in, you know, throughout Africa more broadly because aflatoxin is everywhere, both in maize and also in ground nuts and has yet to be resolved. So I showed a picture earlier of harvesting. Here's another one with women. 
Here's an example of women hand stripping. Here's an example of women hand shelling. Women and girls do this together. And so, um, you know, we see that um, there are major, major bottlenecks in, um, again, on the post-harvest and processing side that have yet to really be dealt with. And, and that's where organizations like ours and others have a big role to play working with all of you. So what does it mean? Well, I see that there is a, first of all, just like the tools, there are a lot of best practices that we can learn from one country to the next without being a cookie cutter approach. Really understanding the context, but also understanding what are some areas and what are some, um, what are some, uh, how do we think about multifunctionality in tools, adaptation across countries, and start to make it a little bit easier for there to be a portfolio of tools um, that support multi-crop threshing or multiple crop grinding or whatever it may be so that we can start to see um, that people are not uh, having to rely on the rudimentary practices of, um, of, you know, of yesteryear. How do we promote protein-rich crops and diverse crops like the ones that Josh was referring to? Um, I think that, was it Brian? Somebody mentioned earlier um, the CoolBot that you guys have in your appropriate technology center. Well, that CoolBot is also across Latin America. It's being used for refrigeration of fruits and vegetables, a whole other area I'm not talking about. But there are um, a number of innovations that are out there. Ultimately, their biggest challenge for uh, large-scale impact, I would say, is around distribution. The distribution is not there yet. The, the market model is not there yet, ultimately, to support the larger um, you know, dissemination and distribution of tools. And therefore, we were called to focus on things that are less sexy, like uh, manufacturing. <laughs> And uh, maybe it's sexy for some of you. Um, it's become very sexy to me as well. Uh, assembly lines, amazing. But, um, but uh, you know, areas that sound more businessy than, um, than we had originally intended to, to, to focus on. But in, in fact, they're, re they're really quite important, and they're the crux of the matter. And then lastly, are there business models that allow farmers, for once and for all, to develop their own brand? one that actually um, highlights their story and what they're doing that includes new opportunities for packaging and labeling and, um, and new efforts to also invest in women and, and youth who've largely been left out of the equation, which is something that I think is so important. And that can be in areas of technology promotion, that can be in areas of food product development, that can be in repair and maintenance, all these opportunities that are there for both on-farm employment, but also off-farm employment, that have yet to be um, that have yet to be really invested in or explored in a deep way. So, lastly, you know, um, I, these are some of the the, um, the portfolio of tools that we already do have. Um, that grinder, in particular, we do sell. The other uh, directly from our from our office in in Minnesota. The other ones are manufactured now only in the countries where we're working, but we hope to build that out. But then there's also more partnership to be done. So we're working with the so Soybean Innovation Lab. And I love this because it's multi-thrasher, which is um, um, misspelled, but I still like it anyway. Um, and you see, this is a whole nother level than what we're working at. But I don't, at first I was, um, I was hesitant for CTI to move in a direction where we would be looking at this level of motorization. But the truth is, the gaps between $10,000 and $20,000 machines and then manually operated machines, there's still some room for, the, for this level of motorization in terms of increasing output. And um, you know, where, where manual, there are just going to, of course, be limitations at some point in terms of actually how much will come from that. And this thresher um, uh, has been built in Ghana. It's, there's been a training done in Uganda. We're working with University of Missouri and University of Illinois to um, build it in Malawi and do some testing with farmers there and uh, traders and entrepreneurs who, who see value in, in higher quality um, seed and, and nuts for, for market. So I think that's interesting and, and um, again, just being open to what's out there. And of course, the training and services that go along with that. If something breaks down, you've got to be able to get in there and fix it and have some basic training. And as we talked about yesterday, that's a participatory piece of work. It's not one training that um, all of a sudden, miraculously, people know how to weld. 
Um, it's multiple trainings, it's an engagement, it's a commitment, and it is community development work as much as anything else. I wanted to um, take a bit more time on the training and services um, because um, here there's a lot of work to be done, I think, to understand where farmers are coming from. And um, we often will sort of jump in, we'll, we'll see a, a problem, we think that we can fix it. We, um, without really going deep into um, getting, capturing data and testimony from the farmers. We've been working with a group called the Improve Group, they're based out of Minnesota as well that um, helped us to develop various, um, again, images, pictures, um, with groups of farmers that are largely illiterate that um, uh, still have something to say. And it wasn't about the technology. If you could zoom into this picture, it isn't about a tool. It's about how, you know, what are the kinds of crops that you grow? What are the different, um, you know, livestock as well? What are some of your other, what are your daily tasks? What are areas where you feel like um, anybody can make a difference in your life or where you feel like things are going well? And it's that deeper, um, you know, um, socio-anthropological sort of understanding that I think is, is so important. And for farmers to also feel like we're listening to them, we're never forgetting what they're telling us, we're trying to do better for them, ultimately creates trust and it creates credibility so that, um, again, not about a one-off tool, but about a, a level of engagement and um, a willingness to keep coming back and keep working with the community um, in areas. So this is a, an image grouping tool. We also um, have other tools that we're looking at for basic technical training, but also business and finance and food safety training, ways that, um, that you know, help to, um, to build capacity without overemphasizing uh, words. So I think um, more or less I'm, I'm close to the end of my time just to say that um, you know, this is actually pictured not from Africa, this is from Haiti. And um, this was a group of women that um, saw an opportunity with, with peanut butter, Brian, <laughs> and you know, they started packaging it in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in simple um, jars. Um, you know, and they've been, they've been thriving as a community and I think that um, you know, again, that's the level that we're working at. So when I come to events like this and I see an opportunity with so many experts in the room, I do um, always finish with a slide, which is how you can help. And, and the, uh, the top of my list is always technical expertise. And so if there's a way that we can, um, you know, have you support our programs um, with um, your background, uh, really welcome that as volunteers or as consultants to help us as we really hope to build a real movement of local food entrepreneurs um, across Africa help to tell the story and to partner with us. And of course, um, there's always the financial contribution as well. Where ECHO is concerned, I would just love hearing about the regional hubs and the potential to share learnings and, um, and some training uh, potentially through, through, through that process where we, have, where we have synergy. So with that, I just want to thank you and um, remind you that um, Again, there are so many challenges that I've, you know, that I've laid out, but there's a lot of joy. And I, I love this picture because this woman captures um, the joy that comes from this work as well. Thank you. Thank you.